Good evening, good evening. What's happening? This your girl Tiffany coming through right here live in effect. And tonight is Monday, June the 21st, 2021. Today I will be dealing, tonight I'm going to be dealing with the topic about two women who made their living by living a low-key lifestyle or what I would say a cook. A clandestine lifestyle, if you will. And for those who may not know what the word clandestine is, that means something very secretive. So these two women lived a secret lifestyle. They was under the black marketing. However, there's a difference. One was a sex worker. The other one was a madam. I'm going to get into that. But anyways... The women that I'm talking about is Hannah, Alice, and also Nellie. Jack, excuse me. Let me make sure I get her last name correct. Yeah, Hannah, Alice, and Nellie Jackson. So Nellie Jackson, she ran a brothel. A brothel is a prostitute. A house for prostitution. She ran that from for sixty years, from the nineteen forties all the way up to no, excuse me, from the nineteen thirties all the way up to the nineteen nineties. She ran that house for sixty years, and that's how she was making her living. Whereas Hannah Ellis was not only an entrepreneur. Okay, she had real estate property. She was a landlord, but she also was a sex worker. And she was she was one of those type of landlords which you would call a slum lord. A, sl a slum lord is somebody that take your money, but it won't do anything. Or she was putting out her tenants and collecting their money. Yeah, she was that type. So, um, again, these women, they lived a lifestyle that was clandestine. And not only that, that would be considered as illegal. Especially with Miss Nellie Jackson, because she ran a prostitution house. I mean, everybody in the area knew what she was doing, even those that was in higher ups, like the police department and whatnot. They knew what she was doing was illegal. Okay. But she didn't bother anybody. She didn't harass anyone. However, she was just running an operation, a business. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go into the information. I'm just going to show some sources and uh, show some books where people can find more information about these two ladies and the areas they were located and then I'm going to close it out. All right, so the first one I am going to do is Miss Hannah Ellis. Okay. So I have uh, information right here. So who was Miss? Oh, give me one. So Miss Hannah Ellis. Who was Miss Hannah Ellis? All right, she was born on in 1865. And they don't know exactly what year she died. But anyways, it says she was an American sex worker and landlord who became one of the richest black women in the world during her lifetime. Okay? So it says she was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at 1820 Addison Street 
one of nine children. Her father, Charles Ellis, was a Negro with Indian blood in him who ran a large, well-regarded catering operation. Her mother, Mary Ellis, was almost white, and they sent her to public school. In 1884, to attend her sister Hattie's wedding and spouse, she borrowed a ball gown without permission from her employer, leading to a sentence at uh, my young my sin prison and her banishment from home. So imagine going to prison because you don't borrow a gown. So basically, she was stealing. It says on her own, supporting herself as a sex worker at a resort owned by Emlyn Truitt in Manhattan's Tenderloin neighborhood, she met wealthy glass factory owner John R. Pratt, 45 years her senior. She left the brothel when her twin brother, David and suitor, Frank P. Satterfield asked her, asked her to live with the latter in a boarding house in East Philadelphia. She became pregnant and gave birth at the Blockery of Blockley Elms House in December 1885, giving the child up for adoption. Then goes on to talk about her affair with John R. Platt. After Alice reunited with Platt, he gave her a large sum of money, volunteered to start her in board, boarding house business at 128 West 53rd Street, whereas a uh, proprietress, she rented a room to Cornelius William. She then moved into a mansion at 236 Central Park West, passing as Sicilian or Cuban. Williams later fatally shot Williams later later fatally shot city planner Andrew H. Green in front of Green's Park Avenue home, confusing him with Pratt. All right. And it goes on to say the blackmail case. So The blackmail case, when Platt plotted by his family, I mean, prodded by his family, accused her of blackmailing him out of 600 and $685,385. The affair married the world's lead story on June the 1st, 1904, describing her as his ebony enslaver. About I mean, asked about allegations that she had been blackmailed as well. She responded, I have read in the newspaper that I have been, and I am frank to say that there must be some truth in a story which is given so much in detail. The novelty of a black woman with the equivalent of 10 tens of millions of dollars living in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in New York caused the CN New York electric bus tour to make Alice House a stop. Platt initially refused to swear a criminal complaint, but relented, allowing police serving a criminal warrant to break down her door, where they were escorted to Alice by her Japanese butler, Kato. At the time, she said, I have no fear. I have done no wrong. And every one of the poor people I have helped is praying for me in the time of my affliction. She was... A a a re a realign was it a Ryan in Tombs Court on June tenth, nineteen o four, held on thirty thousand dollars bail. Meetings at the house of R. C. Cooper at three eighteen W, I mean at three eighteen West Fifty Eighth Street and one four nine West Forty Third Street raised money for her release. When plot was as directly about Hannah Ellis, he aims blows at the reporter with his umbrella and shouted, don't talk to me about Hannah Ellis. The story spread, leading to details 
court coverage in the Baltimore Sun as she took the stand and described how her money was kept in 15 savings banks as well as houses and lands worth $150,000, furniture and plate worth $100,000, and jewelries valued at as much more. After losing his initial court case, the Court of Appeals eventually ruled against plots allowing her to keep his gift. Whoa. Oh, hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. I didn't see you guys come in here. Hello, Melvin. Hello, Aunt, um, Chris. And hello, Jolanda. So, it's hot. Anyways, this woman was getting the hustle on. See, she was plotting a scheme on the man that she was messing around with. And not only she was applying the scheme on him, but she also was taking money from her tenants. But, <laughs> whoo. Now, you want to know how hustle became the hustle, right? Hustle that we know of today has been around for the longest. The old dirty tricks. All the tricks that you know has been around. All these old dirty tricks has resurfaced. So what you hear it, uh, people scamming, people uh, prostituting, all these different things, it's been around for the longest. Prostitution been a business for a long time. Even in the biblical time period, prostitution always been a hustle. <laughs> so Miss Hannah was getting her hustle on. I mean, she was scheming. She was giving up the punani. She was doing it all. Let me go ahead and continue. And she was giving that punani up and she was scheming. All right. So anyways, let's continue. So it says later life. In 1906, Alice evicted white tenants from several apartment buildings on West 135th Street with a note reading, in the future, none but respectable colored families were to occupy the flats. She continued in this vain rumor at 1912 article titled Negroes Crowding Whites as the purchaser of a $250,000 apartment building at 546 through 552 Lennox Avenue. By 1915, she was living in a penthouse in one of her numerous properties at 501 West 113th Street. She joined forces with Noted Harlem developer John Nail, but later left for Europe with her butler Cato never to return. So, therefore, they don't know what happened to this woman. They don't know if this woman had, uh, I mean, it's a possibility of chance she did pass away, but they don't know what how she died or where she disappeared to. They just said she took her money, shoot for the stars. So, she kicked out all her white tenants. And told them, get the fuck out of here. Y'all motherfuckers got to go. I'm going to let all the black tenants live up in here. But you white motherfuckers got to go. Anyways. Let's, let me go ahead and um present some sources to you guys. So, so if you guys want to read up more information. Uh, what I have here is some articles. Some old newspaper articles. Hopefully you guys can see the screen. Cool. All right, so it says right here, Rich Hannah Ellis once in poor house. It says Negro woman who lives in Regal Magnificent on Central Park West also served terms in a Moya Missing Prison and on Black Wells Island. Okay. Right here it says, more strange than fishing. 
is the rise of the woman, Hannah Ellis, who has lately been in the public eye through the stories told by Cornelius Williams, the Negro murderer. From a barefooted altar room in the streets of Philadelphia to a mansion in Central Park West, surrounded by every luxury in the world and waited upon like a princess is a long step. Yet, baseball was a yet. Oh, yet it had it. Yet it has all come to her in less than twenty years. In eighteen eighty four, the woman who, from the perfume satin cushions that formed a window seat in the Central Park mansion, now looks upon throng of carriages that pass and repass in the park. Was a woman without a name about to become a mother and an applicant for charity in philadelphia she had been cast off by her family had served a term in prison for theft and come from the walls of moya missing to find the door of her father's house shut against her and only that of a res resort for colored women open to her and then goes on to say what what Hannah Ellis now pays her Chinese cook or Japanese butler or pite French maid for their month's service would have kept her for many months at that time. The Alice girl was born in Philadelphia at number 8020 Addison Street. She was one of nine children. So, of course, um. I read that part. Anyway, let me skip on down. It says she was then 19 years old, pretty for one of her race with a perfect figure and a love of fine clothes. It was to gratify her desire to shine that caused her first trouble. So it says previous to her commitment, she had made the acquaintance of Frank P. Satterfield a bright young Negro porter in a drugstore at Broad and uh, Ellisworth Streets, Philadelphia. He had met her at her home. And when he heard that she had been released from prison, he went to her. He went to see her only to find that a mission had been denied her and that she had disappeared. Satterfield and Hannah's brother, David, inaugurated a search for her. They found her in the resort of Emily Truett at number 726 Minister Street. Their combined pleadings impelled her to leave the place, but she did not long remain away from the life. And you know what she was doing? She was living inside of a brothel, basically. That's where she was at. The wages of Satterfields were small and he had lodgings in an alley off 10th Street between Vine and Callow Hill Streets, Philadelphia. There he installed Hannah Ellis, who immediately had trouble with the uh, proprietress of the lodging house, a, ne a negress. The Ellis woman had this negress arrested and success successfully prosecuted a case against her in the Bootenwood Street Police Court. All right, so, so anyways, um, I'm not going to go any further, but this is one of the articles, and it came from the World Saturday Evening, November 21st of 1903. So anyways, going on to the next. So that's just one of the articles. Uh, there's another article. Let me see. Let's go to let's see what article I want to use. All right, here's this article right here. This one is from Time Machine. Dot New York Times. Dot com. Okay, this was from New York Times that was published in 1906, November 21st. 
It says Hannah Ellis keeps money. Court of Appeals says John R. Pratt cannot recover $684,000. Albany, November 20th, the Court of Appeals this afternoon handed down a decision affirming the judgment of the appellate division, first department, which dismissed the appeal of John R. Pratt from a decision denying his demand for the restitution of about six. $684,000 by Hannah Ellis. The case has been one of great notoriety. Mrs. Ellis, ha having been as Pratt admitted in court, the recipient of large gifts at his hands, the grounds urged for restitution were those of alleged undue influence over Pratt by Mrs. Ellis. Hmm. So, again, this woman... This woman was, um, yeah, she was, she was a gold digger. She was a gold digger, and she got what she wanted in the courts. But then, you know, you have to look at the lifestyle of African Americans at that time period, which is why men them led into the life of what we know today as criminal activity, because. By her being a Negro woman or African descended woman she was not able to find a job elsewhere. She couldn't find a decent paying job that was going to pay her a, a livable wages. So she went to the streets for the hustle and she got addicted to the lifestyle. She got addicted to scheming. She got addicted to being a gold digger and she got addicted to selling her punani. Yeah. All right. So anyways, um, I have a book that I want to show that goes into more details. Um, right here. So this book right here is called it's called Black Fortunes. The story of the first six African Americans who escaped slavery and became millionaires by Shamari Wills. And this book was written, it was written in 2018. Yeah, so it has not been that long ago. So what I wanna do is I wanna go to, let's go to chapter 17. All right. So it says, the trials of Hannah Ellis. Hannah Ellis passed most, most of her time reading about murders in dime novels and the newspaper. In September 1901, the murder of President William McKinley by an anarchist in Buffalo, New York, filed the page, filled the pages of the local dailies. Two months later, a different scandal arose after his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, was sworn into office and invited Booker T. Washington to the White House. In the headlines of New York papers, the presence of a black man at the White House was called outrageous. Articles about the meeting quoted South Carolina Senator Benjamin Tillman, who thundered the action of President Roosevelt in entertaining that nigger would necessitate our killing a thousand niggers in the South before they will learn their place again. And it, of course, it goes on to say the same year Hannah became pregnant and John Pratt was uh, presumed to be the father. Following spring, she delivered a baby girl at her home and her name was Gwendolyn Ellis on the baby's birth certificate, she listed the child's race as white. By recording Gwendolyn as white, Ellis made manifest her hope that her daughter could achieve what Ellis was able, uh, able to do herself, pass for white. Ellis' life, even as a woman of means, was bounded by race. And in her view, the only way to escape the limitation that came from being rich and black was to escape being black altogether. Let me read that part because that part right there needs to be read very loud. In her view, the only way 
to escape the limitations that came from being rich and black was to escape being black altogether. That was deep. Now that's a deep statement. Several weeks after her birth, the baby became sick and died. Alice consumed herself in making funeral plans, arranging for an elaborate marble mausoleum to be constructed at her daughter's grave site. The work told of $15,000, which is today equivalent to $422,560. And Plot paid the bill. However, I mean, he, however, did not attend to the funeral. Having no other friends, Alice paid her staff to attend her daughter's burial. On the death certificate, Alice listed the child's race as black. As she was dead, there was no point continuing to pretend she was white. Now, that's deep. That's real deep. So in order for her child to... She figured that maybe if she changed the race of the child to being white, that her child would have more privilege. But as opposed to being black, she wouldn't have as much privilege. And for her to escape and be happy as a wealthy woman, she escaped from being a Negro to becoming white or to become any other race color besides Negro. Because the moment that you were found or if you was identified as a Negro, there was no privilege for you. So you was going to be considered as an underclass. And many African-Americans did that. You know, especially somebody who was a lighter complexion. They were able to pass up for another race. And they didn't have to claim their blackness unless somebody pointed out that, oh, you are African-American or you, you a nigger and your parents are niggers and we know this to be a fact. But at that time period, there was no DNA test to prove that. So anybody could get away with doing it. You know? But, yeah, it's the politics. It's the whole politics. It wasn't so much as saying that I'm white because I am a white girl. No, it's I'm white because I want the privilege of a white person. So basically she was doing it by claiming her child to be another race as a political statement. It gets rough. All right. Um, then it goes on to say that on Friday, November 13, 1903, Cornelius Williams stood looking into the mirror of a public restroom in Manhattan, combed his hair, slicked it with a promade, trimmed his mustache with a straight razor, adjusted his gray three-piece suit, and placed a matching ball hat up top his head. He then packed the razor, a gold plate watch, and a revolver into his pockets. He mined his mind was made up. Today was the day he was going to find Hannah Ellis and take revenge upon her. Ellis had evicted him from her boarding house eight years before. And since then, according to those who knew him, William had gone mad. He still carried a grudge against her. And after being evicted from another house a month prior, he had revolved to track her down. When he found her, he was determined to cut her tongue out. However, he hadn't been able to locate Ellis. No one at the church or the black social or eating establishment had seen her in years. Williams decided to extract her wares about from plots whom he know, knew by his pseudonym, Mr. Green, with and with whom he had once a run in at Ellis boarding house. Several days earlier, William found, had found a man named Andrew Green in the in the city directory and had gone to the address of the office listed for him. Leering through a window at Green's office building, William saw an elderly white man with a beard and white hair and 
was sure he had his man. The man he saw, though, was not Platts. It was the New York City planner, Andrew H. Green. That's the one he killed. So let's see. Let me go ahead and scroll down a little bit. All right, so it says, when the deputy arrived at her house, he had to put, push past the crowd to climb the stairs of her home and rang the doorbell. Cato greeted him. The butler um, apologetically told the deputy that he had to deny him entrance to the house because Alice was ill. The deputy sheriff began shouting at Cato, at which point Washington Burns, an attorney hired by Alice, arrived at the house and interceded. There is no reason on earth for trying to arrest my client, he said. Oh, he told the deputy sheriff. Getting between him and Cato, she hasn't any idea of trying to get away. And even and if and even if she had, she is too ill to do so. And so after arguing back and forth with Burns, the deputy conceded that the civil order for an arrest did not allow him forcible entry into the home. Alice could be arrested on a, on a criminal complaint. So it says, the Alice scandal had been in the papers for days with writing that Nick Nigris extorted nearly $1 million and Pratt says Alice obtained nearly $700,000 through threats. The ordeal seemed to spark racial outrage and inflame the economic tension already simmering in the city. Protesting at Ellis House became so popular in the city that men and women were known to pack lunches and bring their children to stand outside her house to hurl profanity and trash at her windows. But damn. So anyways, um, I'm not going to go any further into this book, but you guys can check it out for yourself. It's called Black Fortunes by Shamari Wills. So um, I think this is a very great, interesting book. Because in here, it also talks about Madam C.J. Walker and her daughter as well. So you guys can check that out for yourself. You can go on Amazon if you want to look it up. You can also go on, uh, you can go to Barnes and Nobles. Maybe they will have it available. So, I, but I would recommend you guys check out Amazon. And also you can check out this app called Scribd. Scribd is an app where there's a lot of books, articles, and documentary, I mean, uh, documents where you can uh, read for, you know, just download and just read. And it's like around $10 a month. So, yeah, it's an app on, you can find it on Google Play. I'm quite sure you can also find it on uh, Apple. Yeah. All right. So, I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next topic. So, the next individual who I am going to uh, go into details about. Her name was Nellie Jackson. So Nellie Jackson, like I said, was very similar to Miss uh, Anna Hellis, except that she didn't do a whole lot of scheming. The only thing she did was she had a brothel. And by her running a brothel, she was, um, she was a madam. So that's a title for a woman who runs a whole house. They're called madams. All right. So um, I have some information about her. Now, she was based out of the funny thing is she was in the South. OK. And she was in Natchez, Mississippi. Natchez, Mississippi is the same area where Ibrahim Sore was a slave at for 25 years of his life or excuse me, for 40 years of his life. She was in Natchez, Mississippi. And she had a house on the corner for so many years. Everybody knew where she was and who she was, even those in the law enforcement. Right. Even those in politics, the politician in Mississippi, they knew about her. 
that's how well known she was. And she was making a killing. She was making a living off of running a business, a sex business in her own home. So she was renting out rooms to each of her workers. And of course, they was bringing her all kind of revenues. I mean, because most of her clients were white men. So most of the clients were white men that wanted to come in and seek pleasure from women from all over the world, from different races, backgrounds. And they was the ones with the money because from, from what I um, looked up and from what I was watching, I was watching a documentary on Amazon Prime. She didn't want to take in black consumers. Like she didn't take in black men because she felt like if she took in the black males, they weren't going to pay her. You know what I mean? So a lot of them didn't have the money, of course, because the racial injustice that was taking place in the in the South at that time period, especially in Mississippi area, these men wouldn't be able to afford anything. So she didn't want the black clients. She wanted the white clients. And so she got a lot of white males coming in and paying for the service. All right, so let's go ahead. Let me go ahead and look up... Um, Natchez, Mississippi. Natchez, Mississippi. Mississippi is one of the poorest states in the South. One of the poorest states in the South. Uh, along with Arkansas, Louisiana, and I think it's Alabama as well, if I'm not mistaken. So it says, what the hell? So it says here in this article, it says, she will always be a legend around here. The life of Mississippi Madam Nellie Jessen. All right, Nellie's brothel was an institution in Natchez, for 60 years until her untimely death in 1990. Okay. So this is where the house is located. Located on Rankin Street, only a few blocks from downtown Natchez. Nellie's brothel operated for 60 years. Okay. So here's the highlight. Nellie Jackson began working as a madam in 1930. Brothels were coming along the Mississippi River in Mississippi. Jackson gave back to the community and was informant for the F whoa. Jackson gave back to the community and was an informant for the FBI. T-shirts from Nellie's brothel were popular items. Mm. So Natchez is a town known for its antebellum Splendor with mansions serving as reminders of the days when cotton was king and wealthy plantation owners built homes that reflected their status. But the river town also had another side. Founded in 1716 and predating New Orleans, the settlement had a rough and tumble element that including gambling, whiskey, and women. A part of that history continued until 1990 in a little brothel known as Nellie's. Everyone knew about it. Nellie's was not a secret in Natchez. All right, and the name of the article is uh, Clarion Ledger. Clarion Ledger, which I think that's a Mississippi article. Anyways, it says Natchez has always been a wide open town, said Tony, Tony Byrne. It's it's a river town. We had whiskey when Mississippi was dry. It was very liberal. It's still very liberal. An African American woman, an African American born in 1902, it is said Nellie Jackson moved from Possum Corner to Natchez in 1930. There she established a brothel that became known as Nellie's. The business thrived and operated in plain sight for the next 60 years. Everybody knew about it. Said Byrne, 
a long, a lifelong Natchez resident who served as mayor from 1968 until 1988. Burns said he was friends with Jess and we talked about she was in operation before I was born. We just kind of grew up with it. Uh, Burns family owned a store called H.L. Burn, a place where Jackson shopped and where she took women working for her to shop. It was the largest department store during its day, Burn said. When some of the girls came in, she would take them shopping at three or four places to let people know she had new girls in. She had a steady stream of professionals. Nellie's operation operated with little interference from authorities and as unusual as it may seem today other brothels were operating at the same time along the mississippi river so there's a place in the mississippi river well in the mississippi area called under the hill so it was said that she was working under hill where there was a lot of prostitution a lot of gambling and things of that nature that's where she had started her work off and then of course she got to this profession for the next 60 years of her life i think it was kind of accepted said mark rockway of natchez who along with tim Givens of new orleans produced a documentary about jackson the river town greenville had houses of prostitution Vicksburg too she wasn't the only one by any stretch And then it says, Jackson essentially ran her brothel in plain sight. She even sold t-shirts promoting the business that read, follow me to Nellie's. Everybody had a t-shirt, Burns said. All the locals wanted one. I still have my original one she gave me. The popularity of Jackson's business wasn't limited to not chess, though. Burns said when he would travel out of town, people would ask about Nellie's if he mentioned he was from Natchez. I've even heard stories of people in Europe asking about it, Burns said. I think she was a lot more well-known than we know. Then it talks about how she was a charitable madam. Uh, while her career path was, wasn't exactly unique, Jackson Place in society was like likely was. She wasn't looked down on by most residents of Natchez, and she gave back to the community with her time and money. She was very free with her money for a charitable purpose, Barnes said. If someone was burnt out, she'll give them money or if they were hungry. She never got credit for that. In the civil rights days, she bailed out, she bailed people out of jail. Even, even then, nobody said anything about closing her up. Barnes said Jackson would also provide transportation for nuns in the area and drove them wherever they needed to go. These were acts. These were acts that, according to Brockway, didn't go unnoticed. Nobody had much bad to say about her. Brockway said most people spoke glowly about her, her heart, and her kindness. That's how people were thinking about her. Not so much that she ran a brothel. It says the civil right informant. Although her business was well known, there was a part of her life that, that was not. Nellie's operate operating during during some of the darker years in Mississippi history. Racial atrocities by the Ku Klux Klan were taking place, and names like Cheney, Goodman, and Schwanner made headlines. All of these, all of this drew attention of federal authorities, and Jackson was secretly assisting them. FBI agents would go to her house at night, said Givens, who co-produced Mississippi Madam, The Life of Nellie Jackson, which is on Amazon Prime and also on Netflix as well. They would meet in the room where she did business. She was giving them information about the Klan. Her girls were gathering information for their dates. They would tell Nellie and she would relay it to the FBI. How she became involved with the FBI and why she worked with them is somewhat of a mystery for Givens. We never really got that information, Givens said. We have reasons why, but no proof. You would assume it was for good.
the end of an era. In 1990, Jackson was 87 years old and still running Nellie's, but it was about to come to an end. On July the 5th, a customer went to the brothel one night and became angry when he was refused a date because he was said to be intoxicated. He left but returned with gasoline. Then, not just police chief Eddie Jones told a uh, Clarion Ledger at the time that the man poured gasoline on the front porch, entered the brothel, and poured gasoline on Jackson. The price in the process, he also splashed gasoline on himself. And it says, when he lit the fire at Nellie's, it blew him almost across the street. Burns said both the man and Jackson died from their injuries. With them died Nellie's, but the memories and stories of Jackson didn't. I think her legend is inch. Brockway said it's not going anywhere. She will always be a legend around here. So, and as you see, this is the picture of Miss uh, Nellie Jackson. If you guys can see her picture, okay. That was her picture back in the 80s. All right, so the lady lived her life and made a killing, a career off of prostitution. <laughs> yes, but that came to the end because obviously this white boy, he was upset that she denied him interest because of the fact that he was a drunkie. And because the fact he was intoxicated, he was trying to come over there and he was causing trouble. And by him causing trouble, she wouldn't let him come in. So he got mad, went to the gas station, got some gasoline and attempted to kill this woman and set her whole house on fire. However, he he did set it on fire, but he ended up setting himself on fire. So he ended up getting killed. So, um, but I did get a chance to look at the documentary, and from what I saw, from what I saw the documentary, uh, there was some tragic stories about what was taking place in her house as well. There was an incident where one of her workers got killed inside her home or somewhere in that area, but that didn't stop the business from going, you know, because of that incident. So the point is the reason why she never got called or never got in trouble because they knew that she was so generous and she was very kind hearted to the people in the community to where they're like, we're not going to lock this lady up because the fact that she run a whole house. I mean, that's not the term they use, using, but that's just, that's just what it is. You know, they weren't going to lock her up because she ran a whole house. They like, why, why should we lock her up? What was she, she's not doing anything wrong. Really? You know what I'm saying? Um, she's very given, she's very kind hearted. People know her, so she's not causing any problems. And the girls around her obviously they didn't feel uncomfortable being in the house, you know. They were they felt like they was in a safe place, they was able to do their jobs and go on about their business, you know, make their money, go on about their business, and it's whatever. So that's why she never. She never became a problem. She never been, she never gave them an issue. But anyhow, if you guys want to check out a book about Natchez, Mississippi, there's this book called The Deepest of The Deepest South of All. <clears throat> The book is called The Deepest South of All, True Stories from Natchez, Mississippi by Richard Grant. And this book came out in 2020. So if you guys want to check that book out, you need to do so. You can go look it up on Amazon as well and look it up at Barnes and Nobles. All right. So that's all I have for tonight. Um,
that's all I have for tonight. And I thank you guys for watching. For those of you that were watching, um, make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you have not subscribed, make sure you hit the notification bell. Make sure you share this channel, all that great stuff. And I will reconnect with you all later. So peace and power and elevation be to all of you. This is your girl, Tiffany, and I'm logging off. And y'all be safe, all right? Please be safe out here in these streets. Be safe with this pandemic. Be safe, period, all right? Until then, peace and power, elevation be to all of you. Thank you guys for tuning in. And thank you, Sach. I appreciate that. If I'm saying your name right, Sach. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it as well. All right, so y'all have a good evening. Be safe. <laughs>